Welcome to today's episode of the Indoensis Podcast. Our guest today is a folk-centered independent artist who is well known not only for her songs, but also for singing the theme song of the 2016 film Love Games and a song in the TV show series Four More Shots Please. She was well known even prior to her professional music career as she was a radio jockey as well as a contestant on several reality TV shows. However, in 2018, she decided to leave the corporate world and go full-time into music, where she has been releasing singles and albums independently, as well as with her band, Yatra with Anjil. I'm very excited to be speaking to the wonderful singer-songwriter, Anjil Shivastav. Thank you so, so much for taking the time to come on. Yay! <laughs> Thank you so very much for having me today. <laughs> no issues. All right. So what I like to do on this podcast is go right back all the way to your childhood and kind of walk the steps till the present. So, you know, just to see how your journey has panned out. So let's start right at the beginning. And I've read that you started singing at a really young age from the age of two or three. And your mother sang folk songs as well. So because you started singing so early and because your mother sang as well, did singing feel natural to you from day one? Absolutely, yes. In fact, I keep saying that I was born to sing. And I live with the fact and acknowledgement that the only thing that I could be was a singer. And I was quite literally only born to sing because that's exactly the only thing that I know and I do the best. That's great. And, you know, sometimes with some of the previous guests that have, that have come on, you know, everyone that comes on this podcast are just absolutely incredible musicians, including yourself. And that often shows from their childhood. So, you know, sometimes some of these guests will have these what I like to call prodigy moments. So, you know, for example, um, I had Sasha Tirpati on my podcast a few months ago, and she was saying that at the age of four, she could sing like complex gamakams. I had mm-hmm. Aditya Prakash on the podcast, and he, w- he could identify ragas at the age of like four or five. So w- was there a moment like that for you where your parents or somebody around you went like, oh my gosh, like Angel is, is a prodigy? Or did it kind of build up over time? I think, I think every smallest of the step in my house from, uh, with respect to music and me is a prodigy. And uh, <laughs> I think the first time they realized that their daughter is humming, which was when I was nine months old and I was quite literally beating um, a steel plate with a steel spoon and humming a song that must have been played on television by right then. And my dad said, oh my God, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. I had to call, I had to do big things to make my life or my singing or my career a prodigy for my parents or family. It's the smallest of the things and the smallest of the happiness that they find and they seek in me with my music. Starting from that nine month old uh, little thing, I must have been doing what, yeah, uh, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I remember that telling the story to everybody that, you know, I had to put her because uh, once she was very irritating and she would make noises the whole day in the house with that steel plate and spoon. And second, she could sing. She was humming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. That's a new record. I've, I've had people say they could do things that, you know, three years old, four years old, nine months old is a record for sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm at nine. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Wow. Yeah, and so, something else I find interesting about your childhood is you were based in multiple places around India. So, you know, you lived in Maharashtra, Chandigarh, Himachal Pradesh, and so on, if I'm correct. So do you think being in so many different places and so many different musical environments, was that something that enhanced your musical upbringing or did it serve as a, a disruption in any way? No, no, absolutely enhancing and enriching. Because every state, so I, my dad, uh, all his life, he used to work with ACC cement. And ACC cement, he was traveling from one place to another. I was born in Gwalior, MP. That's my paternal part of the family. Now, from there, we continued to travel in all the places that he was 
transfer to and uh, luckily my parents have been so so nice and so humble that they they made me learn music of that particular state area city wherever we were i have learned from the smallest of the guruji to the biggest of the guruji courtesy my parents because they shy away they didn't wait for really good or big things to come they didn't wait for gurukuls they didn't wait my my parents always knew that they were going to be posted into small cities and states so it was very difficult for them to find gurukuls or big schools or two school of music or la rahman school of music that that child could learn so much and get to the top notch college and i don't think that was their thought also because i come from a very simple middle class non musical non bollywood uh, background so when uh, when we were moving in all the cities i one thing that remained constant actually two thing that remained constant uh, with me was education in each city the best of the education the best of the school i was admitted to the, the only music teacher that that area will have would have me as a student no matter the age no matter the class no matter whether it was one student answer shivastav only or it was 30 students and the youngest is answer shivastav but i was sitting in that class because they just wanted to get rid of me somehow in the house you you say you've been in various different types of classes where sometimes you were the only student and sometimes you were part of a large group how different were those experiences it's like uh, north and south pole when uh, when you're in a group you know you you think that nobody is watching you you think that and especially good part is that i've always learned from guru ji there has never been a, a visharad or a, a, a certifications wale classes it has always been a house set up a school which is in the house set up now as a child you think when there are 30 students the teacher is not necessarily looking at this particular <laughs> child but music and guru ji is so different oh my god one wrong sort of mind out of 30 students or 29 students one big hathodi will come flying straight on my head and i will be bad that how how is it how is it possible and you can't even cry you are not allowed to cry in those classes oh gosh guru ji and gharana is alive if you cry that the exit if parents intervene and they start telling the guru ji that you know my child is a uh, little sweet so please handle with care and all of that at least in my schools uh, in my music teacher classes i realized i noticed that my parents had no say and sometimes my music teacher had more say in my own house than my parents so yes i think and solo on the contrary when you're learning solo you're more attentive because you know now there's no escape yeah <laughs> but i learned a lot in my group classes as well as my solo classes because i was really young when i used to do group classes and i i was the youngest at that point in time and i was caught a lot that my and my subconscious mind was probably working very fast than all the other children then so i learned very well and by the time i reached to the level of single solo study solo student i had already my basics were done and clear my foundation was laid and my teacher when she gave me a lot of life lessons it became like a blessing in disguise for me so it only added up in my life but i would say it's a lot of difference from learning solo to learning group a lot of people find group studies more interesting then solo because solo is monotonous you you know you tend to get bored for one hour two hour three hour they are only doing sa pa sa sa pa sa <laughs> and eventually as a child you feel like are when is the next thing that's coming up i i as we blessed with all the guruji that i have and uh, they made sure that i was a part of them and their family all the music that i'm doing is actually actually the credit will go to then immediately after my parents that's wonderful 
And so, so another kind of interesting facet of your childhood is, you know, you were studying classical music and you, know, you had folk music around your house. But I heard that during your younger days, you were very much into punk as well. How on earth did just punk come into a world of Indian classical and folk? <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, I'll say that I am a brat. I've been a brat. I am the eldest of the house, eldest child, both sides, mm. mom side as well as dad side. And I am the naughtiest of all. I don't even know how has this happened. Children who are 15 years, 17 years younger to me, I fail to understand that they are quiet, they are subtle, they talk sense. Why do they have to talk sense? First of all, I am the one talking nonsense sometimes. I am the prankster. So I think punk also came through via via friends or my uh, atrocious behaviors and friends and environment. And that's how I got a little hooked to that. But I've been exposed to a lot of different kind of music. Because as I said, I, I was sent to every smallest music teacher or music enthusiast in town. So not just my Guruji, who officially was training me in that particular city, like in Himachal, Meena Verma Ji, in Chandigarh, Pandit, Yashpal, Sharma Ji. And along with Meena Ma'am uh, teaching me, there were a gang of boys who were also music enthusiasts and they would perform and every second they would have fun. So I think the punk thing came from them, Tami Bhaiya, Goldi Bhaiya, and all of these people. Interesting. There was a turning point, if I'm correct, in your childhood, because in, in your early childhood, I read that, you know, you had a very sweet voice and, you know, everyone was kind of liking it. And then there was a point where um, probably as, as, you know, as a consequence of just growing up, your, your voice texture changed from a sweeter one to a huskier one. We, you know, which gave your voice a different color and which is the kind of color I think we hear today, um, you know, and th the very kind of vo vocal texture that makes you so popular today. But at the time, I heard that your friends and family didn't necessarily respond well to this change. Mm -hmm. So could you talk us through like when this change came along and what exactly the responses were like? I think um, nobody in my family, first of all, they uh, thought or predicted that I will take up singing as seriously as I was getting there. Mm -hmm. Secondly, when my father and my mom, uh, my parents, they did realize that, you know, music was becoming an integral part of my life. So shows began with the small little group and uh, a small little party, get togethers everywhere I used to sing. And the song list was always done by family, my, my parents. Because, you know, my mom sings, my dad sings, and they're music lovers. So they would always recommend. And that time in time, everybody would like what's trending. The trend was Lata Ji, Asha Ji, the very sweet kind of voices, al Rasmik. And so that, that's the kind of set list I would always do as I grew. I think that was in my 11th and 12th. When I was learning in Chandigarh, I was studying in Chandigarh, when I was learning from Pandit Keshtal Sharmaji, every holiday I would come back and I will complain of sports. And my mom would think and say that probably it's the climate change because the matter was cold, Chandigarh mm. was hot. Maybe it's that, that's the problem. But later, very, very late in my life that I realized that it wasn't the change in the environment, it was the change in my hormones. I was growing up. And the, the way my... Guruji was teaching me then in Chandigarh. That was very different from all my life that I had learned. He was giving me different techniques. I had to open my mouth till so much, so my four, four fingers of your hands absolutely do not touch each other. And no lip touches the finger. Neither lower lip nor the upper lip. And that was the kind of training. So it had to, I, I, my, my throat got trained a lot. But that was his technique. And that's a lot of time uh, taken uh, in a different set of mind also. But um, when I would go, when I would sing, I would start coughing. I would not be able to take high notes. Mm -hmm. And my parents weren't very happy with it. Because they had always seen me take high notes. They had always heard me seem less. They loved the sweetness in my voice, which 
which would come, uh, I, I would call her the nightingale of my school by my seniors. Mm. And they loved that particular part of my life and voice, which is changing drastically from 11th and 12th standard. And then they thought maybe music is not my thing. And even I started losing interest in music because nobody was appreciating. Mm-hmm. Starting from my parents, because they were they were unable to realize that this is a sector that's coming to me maybe. And as I as I as I was in college, I stopped singing. I stopped singing because one, my parents weren't very happy. Everywhere I would go, I would not be able to match the scale of the original song. That point in time, we had to mm-hmm. match the scale of the original song. Right. A child or a singer who would sing with the, from the same scale of the original song was considered great singer. And I wouldn't. I had to, they had to load on the scale and then they would make faces. And as a child, you don't like all of that. And when parents see musicians making faces for your own child, they don't want the child to go through that. So they would take me away. They would ask, okay, pick another song. Maybe pick a song by... Nisha Sharma, which were barely two or three songs then, which were popular. Mm-hmm. It's a song by Justin Narola, because the voices were harsh, the voices were tough, <laughs> the voices were different, unique. So I lost interest. And in college, I had a long past that I said to myself that rarely I would sing. I had a past for over, I think, eight to ten years that I was so underconfident that I wouldn't even sing all by myself. Even oh. when I was in my room, I wouldn't dare to sing. And uh, that only broke when I came to Bombay. And actually, all those eight to ten years, which began with a misunderstanding by parents, it was the universe, the people I was working with, I was a radio jockey. Radio never gave me a chance to do a single jingle. Because they thought that, no, 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 this was for jingle? No, we're not talking. Um, I, I persuaded, nothing happened. And... Only when I joined this company, Value to Sixty Communications in Delhi, and my director saw me doing a lot of good things with music. He said, why don't you do something in music? I think you're fabulous. And then when I came to Bombay, musicians, people established in the industry, Vivek Kumar, uh, manager of Arijit Singh, uh, Azhar, Shashi Suman, the, the composer of... Um, Vijayanta Dilladu, Telu Vikalita, he's also the singer, a fabulous singer. All of, all of these people were the ones who told me, Are you listening so well? Why? Why don't you sing? And they made me record my first crash. And I recorded that first crash. From there, the confidence built again. To cut to today, eight years down the line, I'm in Bombay. And I think I started first like three years ago and my parents are really, really, really fond of my this voice now. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And like now ever everyone loves your voice. So <laughs> all the oh, ends well as well. <laughs> but um yes. I-, I want to go back to that period um once again where, where you weren't singing because um there was another guest that came on that podcast who had a similar story. Um, I, I mentioned her name previously, Sasha Tirupati. She, you know, there were people in the industry who were criticizing her singing. And so she stopped singing herself for around two or three years. But something interesting that she told me was that for her, that period where she wasn't singing was a blessing in disguise because she focused on other aspects of music. She, you know, got into composing and producing and became really good at that you know, in the two years where she wasn't singing. So did, did anything similar happen to you? Did you focus that that time you used to sing into something else when you weren't singing? Or did you kind of take a break from music on the whole? I told you I was a brat. <laughs> Brats don't focus on anything at all. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> no, I am a child who is loved. I've been raised with immense, tremendous, I'm the first child of the house. If I would have said gold, gold would have been given to me. So, rap and this uh, nature came so automatically to me that I, I didn't even realize that I wasn't singing for 10 years. 
I ever said that only in Bombay I realized that oh my God, I was made for singing. It took me thirty years to even acknowledge this life time that hello, you're made for singing. Hello, what are you doing? So no, I couldn't focus on anything. I didn't think that I wanted to focus on anything. Fair enough. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Do Do you see it now, looking back, as just destiny? Singing was just. I don't know. I I am. I know just one thing. I am made for singing. I will. But and everything in my life comes late. I I became a better human only recently. I have grown up and evolved as a person only recently. I have found my best friend, best friend of life for life. Only recently, I have started to understand my family, love, relationship, importance of relationship, friends. Only recently, I'm saying only recently because, dude, I'm 34. You don't do that literally two years ago. You kind of move on to doing many other things at 34, but. At thirty-two, you're saying, "Oh, you have to behave. Oh, on your life, your behavior was poor. Oh, you were a rude person, Anshul. Behave. Be a better human. Be cognizant about the fact that people love you. People like you. You don't say, oh, yeah. No, that attitude is not true. So, I think destiny, yes, destiny, hundred percent." And I will say, destiny is explaining me a lot of things. And they say which time it happens, and my time is probably after thirty. Fair enough. <laughs> Everyone has their own timelines. I mean, I'm only twenty, so I don't know what my timeline's going to look like. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyways. <laughs> So going to your 20s, um, you were a radio jockey at 94.3 uh, My FM. And I'm aware that, as you said, actually, that they didn't really give you a chance to sing, unfortunately. But from a pure RJ perspective, was there anything you learned there that you feel contributed to your current career as a musician? Yes, absolutely. I think I'm able to write and sing. Because I was a radio jockey and I learned the art of writing when I was in radio. So in radio, you have to write your own script. You have to write your own show. And when you are beginning, there is a lot of prep that goes. So it's unlike what we see in Metro Cities. That, you know, there's a producer, the jock comes and reads newspaper, pick up, picks up three lines and no, no, no. That is not how the beginning of a radio jockey is. It's very different. I had to write my own script and I used to also do a late evening show wherein you had to, I had to do share, shiry, um, poetry, recitals and all of that. So my uh, reading improved, my communication improved, my word and languages improved, the difference of fear and fear improved. All of that today. I am using and is helping me become a better composer, better musician, better singer. I think I'll give 100% credit to radio for that. Did you get chances to like directly interact with, with musicians at your radio station or not really? Yeah, a lot of times. A lot of times. I would do it all the time. I have interacted with almost everybody. Shankar Hassan Loy, wow. uh, Sonu Nigam. As a radio jockey, these are the first, and especially I was very, I was a music enthusiast, and I was the youngest in the whole radio station. And that I will always mark myself as. So they had no way, but uh, they had no way out but to say yes to all my uh, asks. And my first ask was, if there's anything related to music and musicians happening, I'm going to interview. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I had interviewed everybody, and it was uh, it was fun then. But I never had the guts to even sing in front of them, even one line. Mm-hmm. Never had the guts to tell them that I had learned classical all my life. So, yeah, see, <laughs> imagine <laughs> it was such an easy game for me. 
<laughs> well, what sort of conversations would you have with them? Would they like come after they release like a certain song or would it just be like a general conversation? What would that be like? It will be yes, mostly about the song or the uh, film that they're doing or upcoming. Mm-hmm. And with legends like Shankar and Sam Loy or Sonu Nikam, it will always be about their life journey, along with if there's something that's upcoming or if there's something that's just released. So they will sing that song, they will be doing the promotion of that particular content with us, along with me having a lot of conversation about them, their lives, their recent conversation because that time there was no instagram facebook people wouldn't know what's happening in their life every day right. so through radio radio jockeys it was the only source of conversation which would reach them faster so it was fun to know what's happening in their lives it was fun to know how they treat their music it was fun to know whatever was coming out whether they liked doing that or they didn't like doing that or how much time have they taken doing that so yeah, that's the kind of conversation we would generally do. Interesting. And yeah, you, you talk about your, your radio journey during this period as, you know, being able to talk to all these legends and it sounds great. But I also understand that towards the end, it became really difficult for you because I believe you wanted to try and seek bigger opportunities to, to try and be the RJ at bigger radio stations. But things didn't quite work out that way. So... I guess my, my question is kind of twofold. So firstly, what, what made you want to try and push for a bigger radio station? And secondly, what were the responses you were getting when, when you tried to make those moves? See, everybody has aspirations. I think we all like to grow in life. And I'm a hustler. And I like to, I like to move really fast. So when, when radio was happening with me, I wanted to grow really fast. I wanted to achieve bigger radio stations, better show, and I wanted to get more awards. I wanted to be awarded for the kind of show that I was meant for. That's what I felt, that I was meant for uh, evening drive time, not mid-morning, not late afternoon. That wasn't me. I was more fun. I wanted to do all of that. And my current radio station had different plans for me. And I didn't want to continue those little plans with them. So I, everybody, every individual wants to move out want to look around so i also looked around and i had i got a great opportunity but it didn't seem favorable uh i don't know what happened what was the miscommunication for my current radio station which had employed me my son with a new one that was going to employ me and almost had finalized me as a radio jockey and it didn't happen so i will say that there was this two months phase of my life where i had put down my papers at my son and they didn't hire me also. And in those two months, I was jobless. That was, that was the worst and the best phase of my life because that made me today who I am. That gave me the best slap of my life. That nothing, no matter how amazing you are, there is nothing that is not, that is not irreplaceable. Tomorrow, any new trick person, boy, girl, person will come, replace you. If you throw attitude or if you, and, and in a setup which is profession, in a setup which is rules, regulations, discipline, you either follow them or you move out to do your own thing. That time, own things were not a thing. It's, that time, it's, nobody was a setup. That time, nobody was an independent musician or indie artist or anybody for that matter. Everybody was an employee. I was. The two months of unemployment gave me a whole new reason to find employment, to get back to discipline, to understand discipline, and to work for somebody diligently so that I never get slapped as tight as I got slapped by my radio station for doing literally nothing, just being an aspirational RJ. Just been wanting to be a better RJ, a better position, a better job, a better uh, monetarily benefited person. So all of that uh, happened and I moved back to Delhi. I was at Jaipur at that point in time when this happened. Two months of 
I think I would leave my hostel sharp at nine in the morning, reach only at seven. Wherever that hostel would feed me in the morning as breakfast would be the only meal that I would have because I didn't have the money. I didn't have the courage to ask my parents for that money because I had not told them that I was jobless. Oh, wow. And I had come back to Delhi. I had told them that, listen, I'm, 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 you know, there are newer things that are shaping up. And only after a month did I tell them because I was miserable. From nine to seven, I knocked every door. I had about 20 CVs in my hand and my target was to deliver 20 CVs to 20 different offices each day. Because I believe 1% of conversion. So I thought at least two people will call me back. And one month I continued this. I was as a receptionist at the gym for a couple of hours so that I could pay that uh, hostel fee where I was living. I so that, and, and then immediately after my shift got over, I packed my bag, I changed my clothes, looked decent, and went straight for cold calls, sat, caught up with my old friends, asked them if there was a vacancy in their organization, met old bosses, asked them that I could do anything from sales to everything. One fine day, when I told my dad that, you know, this has happened, and he said, no problem, take this money, Continue doing what you're doing. You'll get it. The next morning, I got a call from Value 360 Communications HR. And she said, we'd like to have your interview. But the position is for business development. Mm -hmm. I said, ma'am, I'll come. Deepa, that HR, still loves me, still is connected. Value 360 Communications is the reason that Ansel today is doing music. Ansel today is following her dreams. Ansel today was employed that time, Ansel was employed double the salary that she did a station. Was taken up as an executive because they believed in the honest and honesty that I had. With that honesty, I told them that, you know, this has happened. I'm an ex-radio. I don't know anything about business that happened. I know only radio because I was picked up from college. But I'm happy to learn and I will not disappoint you. And next morning, I had my appointment letter. And I think what radio did was the best thing. Otherwise, I wouldn't have come to Bombay. I wouldn't have ever started singing. I wouldn't have ever told the world that, hey, no, radio is wrong. <laughs> I am a kick-ass singer. I mean, you did have a, an MBA in international business and marketing, if I'm correct? Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah it, it did work out. You weren't like a complete beginner or anything like that. You didn't go to college to study. And <laughs> 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 lectures in college. I study everything. Come on. So I was awarded as the best student of the college. My gosh. So so you so you're that type that the one student that never studies but gets hundred and everything. <laughs> Hundred, but yeah, seven eight CGPA. I was managed. I think I was decent. Is just I I was a, I am a bird. I am a butterfly. I like to fly. I am water. You put me in a jar, I'll take that shape. You put me in a glass, I'll take that shape. So I am free so If you try and bound me with rules, regulations, tell me that you know move here, move there. Then I can't do much. Leave me. Let me be. And you have the best of me. I guess that, that really suits for your current career because, you know, you're, you're self-employed basically and you have artistic freedom and you can do, you can move wherever you want using your metaphor. So I guess, as you say, it was meant to be. <laughs> Early on in your musical career, you were doing a lot of things. You were doing covers, you were um, contacting uh, composers in the industry. You did all sorts of genres of songs. Uh, I remember us playing your, your songs on shuffle just to get a feel of what your music was like. And then PR Ki Kahani came up. I'm like, where did rap come from? <laughs> but you, you were really doing all sorts of music. So was it musical curiosity? that drove you in these diff 
different directions or was it because you weren't sure what to specialize in? I think both. So as an artist, uh, and, and as I said, I started very recently, full time, three years. So initially you don't know much and no matter how many people come and tell you all about their experiences, your experiences and your learnings as well. And so when I began, I thought that I was great at a lot of things. I, I believed firmly in the very line that people say, well, as an artist, you need to be versatile. You should be doing everything. You should be able to do a lot of things and different things. So I wanted to do a lot of things, different things. But what happened over time, I realized, actually, my brother is the biggest uh, inspiration and instrumental in making me realize that as an artist, every artist has a genre. It's very good to realize what genre is your genre. And if you master your genre, you will, you will become you, you have no idea how popular and how famous and how, how uh, amazing you become as an artist, which is the end goal that every artist wants and aims and achieves, I think. So initially, I would dabble around everything. The Arki Kahani, that rap came to me because that done for, for Valley 360, they wanted to do a song, this is a rap song. And uh, when I was, and I was only going to compose, I was only doing the project. But uh, as and when we brought in the singers and we started to dub them, I, they also heard my version of the scratch. And they said, we like the scratch more. We like your voice more. And I, I was really very happy. I'm knowing of the fact that that is not my genre. But if somebody else is saying, Maybe they would have they would have had the soft corner for me, and and that's the reason probably they like they like my version more than any other version. But I will say that eighty percent of them said that Anshul's version, Anshul's version, Anshul's version. So eventually my version came out, and uh, I was happy. I was experimenting at that point in time. So rap also happened. Then pop song. Uh, there's another song that I did for Shitty Idea, sending that to YouTube channel and they do a lot of uh, YouTube series. I did a song for them. Uh, that, that, that's a very different, unique song. I wouldn't ever sing that if somebody tells me, or it will never naturally come to me. Mm. And that, that was a very different song that I sang, I think. Um, that had a different vibe only. So all of those were initial days experiments. Today, if you ask me, I know my genre is better. I know that I'm great at soulful and folk. I would rest my case on other genres. I would rather become very popular or do good music at folk and soulful, like all my original vows here. Yeah, they have soulful vibes. My, when I'm doing folk, I have a folk vibe. So I'm trying to stick to that because in three years I've realized that this, this is my vibe, this is my genre. But prior, I didn't know folk, I did it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's interesting what you say, because even though you do call yourself, you know, folk centered, not all of your songs are necessarily folk. Like there's a lot of kind of melodies or even like semi-classical um, kind of kind of songs in there. So, you know, I think um, so, something interesting throughout the, the past few years in your journey is you found like not necessarily just one genre, but just, you know, a collection of genres or like a general space that you're strong at rather than necessarily, you know, one specific, you know, must be this and this only, you know, not, not like that. So, you know, I just find that interesting. Um, and, you know, uh, across your, your career as a professional musician, you've worked around with uh, many other musicians and producers for, you know, all of the tracks that have come from you. And one challenge that you've talked about in one of your previous interviews is finding a producer that brings out the best in your voice. So I'm curious, how do you go about finding the right producer? Are there certain characteristics or skills that you specifically look for? No, in my case, I say it'll only come with time. 
I have to work, and I'm working with a lot of different producers. And uh, because I'm still, see, as as you also rightly pointed out, that there are amalgamation of many genres, probably, in my songs and different songs. Which is the best genre, or which is the genre that I'm made for? Is that genre coming out right? Is that folk? That what kind of folk? That the original ethnic folk or an electronic folk or a contemporary folk? What kind of folk mm. am I made for, or am I supposed to do? So that will happen only when and if I work with multiple people or have spent enough time with music, with two or three of my music producers, make more versions of the same song and same style, work more on it, and that's how. I pick and choose my producer also. So now, now with time, I've zeroed down on three people that I work very closely with, who are producing with me and for me. So I think we all pretty much like each other's vibe, and we've understood what we like and what we can deliver to each other, what we should deliver to each other. One is Aditya, another one is Kanya Pandit, another is Pranshuja. These three people give me different. Unique and my kind of vibe, and working with all three of them at for my different different songs. I think that is what is making me get closer to my genre and bring out the better in my genre and my uh, expertise. Do you think their kind of musical input helped you discover your own strengths better in any way? I will say yes. Their their input definitely helps. But they also get carried away sometimes mm-hmm. because we're doing music 24 hours together, and sometimes the brain says, "Yes, this is my let's do this, block it now, finally." So what happens now? My practice is when I'm doing the song. If I'm doing the song with Aditya, I will not continue to ask Aditya or give my opinion about that song. Mm-hmm. I will make two or three versions of that particular song at scratch. Mm-hmm. Make Three different unique people who are not related to music. Hear them, and then ask them which is the song that you like the best. And mostly that becomes my brother first because he is great. He has the ear for my sound, my vibe. He works with a lot of independent musicians, so he knows that what is what will work, what will not work, and in so. So this is the thing my practice now, and this is what I'm trying to do more often. Yeah, and speaking of your independent work, the reason why you and your team contacted me is because you had a song come out recently, Nadan Dil. It's a beautiful song, and the music video also just came out a few days ago. It's been doing really well on streaming platforms and on YouTube. So congratulations, ah,、uh, for that. Thank you. And I heard that you you wrote the song two years ago on a flight to Bangalore,、yeah. but you shelved it because you thought it was an average song. It sounds great now. So so, what made you think it was average back then? My hashtag BFF Divya Batra Dal, who stays in Bangalore, is also the founder of Jewelry Brand Work. I was on my flight to meet her. And I was working on a project, and I was supposed to make a song for them. And I made, I wrote, and I composed my band name for them. Basically, that was the assignment I had to do. When I reached first to tell her to sing it to her, and I wanted, and I and her opinion mattered a lot to me. She is also a writer. She is a music lover, and she understands my kind of music. So it was very important for me to know what she felt. She heard her. She heard the song Nagandhar instantly, and she she looked at me and she said, "I think you can do much better, yeah. This is a very average song. Why? Just two hours you made it, and it's fine. You know, you don't have to make every song、uh, because you made it. So maybe I think you can do better. I mean, think about it. I said, 'Yeah, makes sense.' Two hours flight. I can't get so tired with this particular creation just because I made it." And I'm on, I'm on working on time. I know to do that, so I forgot about the song. But I remember the lyrics, and I have a habit of recording the song on voice note. Right. Every time I'm trying, and best times that I make music is when I'm driving or I'm on a flight. 
Not the first Not person who said that. <laughs> Many people say that, yeah. Now, two years down the line, I had quite literally nothing. I was working on nothing and I wanted to make songs and I was going blank every time because we're trying to work really hard on a new song. And there's so much that come out. I'm confused what's my genre. I'm, from, I'm, I'm looking at my previous songs. Kadi Aoni is doing Chartbusters. My folk songs are doing very well. People are calling me the folk voice of 2022. But at the same point in time, people are liking Vosham, Vap, Type of songs. Kiki Kata Tum. A lot too. I don't know. What should I make? And I wanted to make her. And I had this girl in front of me, Vidya Gopal, and I wanted to do a song with her. And I just asked her, and she had she said yes. And I couldn't have let this opportunity go away by saying, no, I don't have a song. I will work on something and come back to you tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So I remembered that I had a song two years ago. I have not worked on it. Let me just sing it to her. She liked it. I'm like, fine. We're doing this. <laughs> Interesting. I didn't think that I was going to release it so soon because we just started working on the song. We dubbed it and, and everything... Everything was so quick, seamless, that the song is out the first. That's, that's wonderful. And do, do you think the, the kind of story behind the song, you know, because the song is about the, the friendship between yourself and, and Vidya, do you think that the fact that it was about friendship kind of changed the meaning of the song for you compared to when you first wrote it? Like you, you first wrote it just as a song, right? But now you had this additional component to it. Do you think that changed your perception of the song? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. I have not written this song from friendship perspective. It was absolute love song for two lovers, girl, boy. And, you know, the boy wooing the girl and the girl, you know, whatever. And I thought that we'll do a male with female. And I was not even going to sing because that was an assignment. Mm-hmm. I wasn't going to do Nada and Del Orban myself. And now when Vidya, so this, this has turned 360 degrees around. This was never going to be a girl-girl song. This is never going to be about friendship. This is never going to be about love two friends have for each other. This is always going to be a typical love song. And finally, when I made the song, when I wrote the storyline, and when I, I haven't changed the opening. I had always written Nada and Will, Kaitarmi. But I have not written ahead. I have not written the word. Mm-hmm. The word is thought through, thoughtfully written, and written now with a thought called friendship. Interesting. Yeah, it's always fascinating to hear when, when the story of a song changes, like especially as drastically as it's changed for you. So yeah. that, that's very interesting to hear. Yeah, so um, we've we've covered a lot of aspects of your career as a musician, and I, I kind of want to start to wrap up now. So what do you have planned in terms of future releases and works? I was told that you have something releasing in the end of July, if I'm correct. Yes. <laughs> so I'm done with the song called Kaha. That's uh, my song, and I've got Kanish Sethi coaching it with me. Oh, Wow. Yeah, so Kanish has done a brilliant job with Kaha. And uh, Kaha will release by the end of July. If not July, then August. I think July is too soon because we still have done with Nada and they like in the whole July. Nada and will only continue. So I think I'll push it with a couple of days and okay. release it a little later. But uh, Kaha is ready. And after Kaha, I will be uh, sitting straight to Sumi Bejo, which is a song with Vasudha Sharma. The Chandu Kita, Chandu Kita, Kita, Kita Girl. I just love her. I'm such a big fan. I'm such a big fan of her. Now, when I met her, and she, she was like this doll. She was like this Barbie. <laughs> and I continued to stare at her that we were working on a project together. And I was the producer of the project, so I was obviously leading the project. And when I, and this song, I think I 
as a fan girl i sent the song to her and i didn't even have the guts to call i sent her a voice note i sent her a song like that like you know i'd like to do this song with you if you don't mind i mean seriously she's like what do you want to do this song with you again <laughs> so yeah so i think after kaha is going to be tumhe bhej you after tumhe bhej you with what that is going to be the song called fire with aata singh that also one of my favorite favorite most favorite songs and aata is an incredible singer i think uh, one singer who is underrated and when he will come out he will be like a lion that is aata singh for us Wonderful. Wow, it seems like you've got a lot of stuff planned ahead so uh, lots of good music to to keep us excited. And I like to end my podcast with the same question to every guest. And it's not necessarily a special question but it's kind of become tradition here. So the question is, what's on your playlist now? Na da ni de. Good answer. <laughs> I'm listening to it. I think uh, I really like it. But yes, apart from that, uh, two of my most favorite songs on my playlist. One is Khairi Khairi Pari Kinari. That is by Sudha Pandit and Vidya Gopal. And another one is um, I uh, Raja Kaushik Khairi Rasti. I don't know how to sing that because that's a very very pretty song. But Khare Rasta by Raj of Course is one of my most favorite tracks. Wonderful. One thing that I want to ask: um, a lot of people, a lot of artists have told me once they release a song that they don't like listening to it because then they start like nitpicking. Or you know, they start thinking, "Oh, I should have done that. Or I should have done that," and they just. Is that not the case for you? You don't do a brat out of it. I didn't think so much. Oh come on, this is not the only release that I'm going to do. Don't like my song? Don't listen to it. Okay, listen to the next one. You love it. <laughs> Perfect. I think that's the way to go forward for everyone. <laughs> oh, I've got more releases. Come on, guys. Wonderful. So on that note, uh, I think we'll finish off there. Uh, thank you so much for your time, and thank you to the listeners for tuning in. Make sure to ch- uh, to check out Anja's music and her social media in the description below. So thank you very much once again for your time. Thank you very very much for having me today. Well, that was Anjal on our 16th episode of the Indowencers podcast, and thank you to everyone that has tuned in. You can find us at the Indowencers, spelled T H E I N D O E N C E R S, on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or you can use the links in the description. Likewise, you can find our homepage at theindowencers.wordpress.com or through the link in the description. Make sure to subscribe to the Indowencers podcast on your favorite podcasting platform. Thank you once again and we'll see you next time.